Layoffs, hiring freeze, cost cutting, a revenue slowdown coupled with a market sell off. After a 13 year long bull run, gloom seems to have set in as tech companies grapple with a floundering economic outlook. The winter everybody was alluding to finally seems to be here. Over the last few days, the world's largest tech companies have been saying sorry to their employees for firing them at a time when the conversation has firmly moved from managing growth to surviving a recession. From Meta to Twitter to Stripe and Snap, more than 52,000 workers in the U.S. tech sector have been laid off, according to a crunch based tally, and more pain is expected in the next quarter of the financial year. Google, Apple, Microsoft and Amazon are tightening their belts as they reassess the market scenario. Startups have not been immune to the meltdown as funding has dried up. Global VC funding hit a nine-quarter low in Q3 with the largest quarterly drop in a decade as per CB Insights. The tremors have reached India as well with funding falling to a two-year low in the September quarter. In fact, Indian startups have also handed out pink slips to more than 17,000 employees so far this year. And the agony is palpable with some on the startup streets saying that 2023 could be a dot-com level bruiser, something that most young tech founders have not experienced. So what does the global tech tumble vote for India's startup economy and what should the playbook be to take on what 2023 has in store? Hello and welcome to Young Techs, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Shireen Bhan. Joining me today for our Voices from the Valley special from San Francisco, Priya Raj and Managing Director of Silicon Valley Bank, Sanjay Nath, co-founder and managing partner of Bloom Ventures. He joins us from New York. Meanwhile, Seattle-based Will Poole, co-founder and managing partner of United Ventures and Capria Ventures is currently on a visit to India. Priya, Sanjay and Will, thanks very much for joining us here on this special edition of uh, Young Turks. Priya, let me start by asking you, and uh, first of all, thank you to Sanjay and you for joining us. I know it's a very, very early start for both of you, and particularly you, Priya, you're joining us from San Francisco. Uh, you know, the headlines are screaming, tech austerity, tech crunch, tech winter. Uh, how bad is the mood in the valley at this point in time? Yeah, uh, one, I just want to say thank you for having me here. Uh, again, great to be here alongside my good friends and Jayan Will. Um, and, uh, you know, just talking about the current market volatility, I mean, our just starting with the long term view that we have that innovation economies will continue to grow globally and it will perform an aggregate. So I think we just need to have that in mind as we're kind of diving into this. Uh, you know, the tech and life sciences are kind of facing definitely a significant headwinds uh, with the public, volatile public markets, uh, you know, here, here from US, you know, the interest rate hikes that's happening, the war in Ukraine, the inflation, and the COVID that never seems to end and it kind of the associated challenges. Uh, what we're seeing in the next few quarters is likely to be bumpy um, uh, that, you know, probably the hardest that we've ever seen uh, for the innovation sector. Failure rates will likely be higher uh, that we have seen in the recent years. The companies are continuing to and will focus on uh, cutting costs and uh, the access to liquidity will be tighter. But one thing I do want to remind is like, you know, this has been a historical trend in venture capital and the innovation sector uh, uh, during the previous economic cycle. So I think, you know, we've been through a few of these and we'll get through this as well. So I just wanted to lay that as well. Yes, it's important to have that perspective. And of course, that's exactly what we were talking about. Many young founders uh, don't necessarily have the experience or the perspective of having dealt with the downturn, especially not a downturn of the kind that we are currently seeing. But Sanjay, I, I want to discuss one of the important issues that Priya spoke of. And I think Mark Zuckerberg uh, spoke about that in his apology note to employees. Uh, when Zuckerberg says that at the start of COVID, the, rapid, the world rapidly moved online, there was a surge of e-commerce, which led to outsized revenue growth. And many people predicted that this would be a permanent acceleration that would continue even after the pandemic ended. I did too. And so I made the decision to significantly increase our investments. I got it wrong. I take responsibility for that. Sanjay, uh, you know, this is, this is an important acknowledgement as much as it is an apology, because many people believe that the kind of changes that we saw through the pandemic was structural in nature, that we would never go back to work from office, that work for home was here to stay, that travel would never be the same again, that e-commerce would only continue to go one way, which was higher and higher. Uh, and a lot of those assumptions are being challenged and being tested at this point in time, Sanjay. Uh, you know, how much do you believe the current pain is on account of just an overestimation of the structural shift that we assumed COVID had brought on? Sure, Shireen, a great question, and thanks again for having us all on. 
you know, one one thing I'll mention is that uh, that you know, uh, let's all know that we're in a very cyclical and a long term game in a business, right? We've seen, I mean, the industry itself has seen similar downturns around the turn of the century, around the Lehman crisis in 2007 and 2000, uh, 2008. Um, you know, as we know, in boom times, uh, there is a focus on growth, sometimes at the expense of. And when we look at the stage we're going through now, it is about belt tightening, and that's not unusual. I think Priya made an interesting point. There is a, uh, you know, one interesting way to frame it is that what you're building is that a vitamin or a painkiller, right? So I'll just give you some examples. If you look at the SaaS side, I think we're seeing very continued, uh, strong continued focus on, let's say, cybersecurity and, uh, um, you know, compliance, right? Just to name two examples. Uh, if you look at just pure collaboration or uh, I would say important but nice to have, there's certainly going to be either cut back or maybe plateauing of spending. On the consumer side, uh, you know, to answer your question, it's not going to be growth at the expense of, in one sense, you know, we all sometimes unfortunately need this to return back to first principles and fundamentals. This is a return to fundamentals. Now, we have been telling all our founders from day one that you should build to uh, positive unit economics, regardless of, you know, what the market scenario is. And now, you know, you it's not a nice to have, but you're forced to do that. So, Shreen, to answer your question, I think we've seen, I mean, winter is now not just figuratively, but, you know, geographically almost here. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was just looking at one of the tweets that, uh, you know, Hemant, uh, 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 my friend at Lightspeed wrote. And I do agree with that, which is uh, that, you know, the the uh, the best are going to get separated from the good, right? Because you really have to uh, come back to fundamentals. And it's not just focusing on growth at the expense of, but uh, can you build to profitability? And we're also seeing the IPO markets reward that, the ones that are able to build to that and are able to build yeah. sustainable uh, standalone businesses will be rewarded. Uh, yeah, you know, you're right in pointing out that when the going is good, uh, uh, you know, all boats are lifted. But at this point in time, as liquidity starts to dry up and you've got your back against the wall, it will be uh, those who have focused on the fundamental on actually building a business model that will be able to ride out the storm. But, Will, uh, you know, you're here in India. Uh, so I want to understand from you, in terms of a pulse check, how different does the mood feel between what's happening in the U.S. and what you're seeing here today? Well, my perspective is actually across um, the 10 hot spots of tech across the global south. And that includes Bangalore, of course, and, and, and Delhi and, and Mumbai. And, and frankly, I've been waiting for this correction for four years. And I think it's a good thing for the market. Um, it was just insane that everybody knows you couldn't hire people. You're getting paid, fed up too much. And it, it needed to happen. And uh, I was meeting with a founder here in India just uh, last week. And he said, you know, I asked him what I could do to help him. And he said, uh, please help me find metaverse engineers. And I said, don't worry, Mark Zuckerberg will solve that problem for you next week. And he did. Um, so we're seeing the same kinds of things play out across the other uh, other emerging economies. Uh, we're seeing uh, slowdown, obviously, in, uh, in, in, in the late stage, but we're seeing continued investment in the early stage. Um, and in our case, uh, here in India, mm. six of our 10 best companies have, have actually raised money since the slowdown started in the last six months. So money is still flowing. There's record inflows in 20, uh, last year, um, 2021. It was incredible. That money needs to be spent. Investors are going to spend it. They're going to spend it in larger chunks in earlier stages. Um, they're going to spend it less in later stages. And obviously, people in the public markets are going to continue to suffer with the companies that were doing growth at all costs. Anybody that's not got the, with the program is going to suffer as well. They need to focus, as Sanjay said, on unit economics on sustainable growth and a path to profitability and the entrepreneurs that do that well are going to be rewarded. You know, very interesting point that you made there in terms of talent. Uh, I remember I was uh, in the Valley uh, through 2020 and 2021 and everyone was talking about uh, you know, getting onto a hotline with other founders just to be able to get one engineer. Talent was at their peak through 2021. And today we're talking about layoffs. We're talking about tech austerity. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, as you mentioned, Will, 13%, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the kind of uh, number that we've seen Mark Zuckerberg lay off at Meta for the first time in the com company's 18-year history. But Priya, I want to address the valuation issue. Uh, you know, public market volatility uh, we've seen for the last few months now. They're clearly punishing just about everything at this point in time, uh, irrespective of fundamentals. Uh, 
Masayoshi Son at SoftBank, while SoftBank is going through its own challenges, and we'll address that through this conversation as well. Uh, one of the things I found interesting that he said was, and I've heard this from other VC investors, that founders are yet to accept or come to terms with the valuation uh, dynamics changing. They're yet to accept that. Uh, are you still seeing that, or has there been a dramatic shift uh, in the last few weeks? I think I think there's a shift happening. I think there's a reality that's sitting. I mean, I think 2021 was a uh, was a kind of exciting year for for a lot of things that has happened. You know, just uh, uh, just to address what Will said, that was interesting. We were what we're seeing is like the deal activity that has across the stages is definitely showing more signs of distress. And I see there's a bar that showed that the early stage is lukewarm that you said like a warm. You know, before we felt that early stage was not being affected, but we're seeing that impact kind of happen across stages. Now, the founders are feeling not just only at the late stage or, hey, IPO is kind of tightened out or not happening, but there are, it's kind of across the entire you know stage of financing. That's one. Uh, and you're seeing the VCs do have a lot of dry powder, but what they're doing is uh, because they're having challenges in raising their next round and their LPs are holding them accountable and have a greater disi investment discipline. You know, they're, those two are interconnected. So we're seeing that kind of uh, kind of trickle down to what the founders do. So fundraising is taking a little bit more longer time. And uh, I, the, as you're uh, obviously seeing, the VC VIN investment totaled, uh, is, especially in the U.S., about $43 billion across estimated about 4,074 4, deals in Q3. It's a nine-quarter low, as you had highlighted earlier as well, in, for deal value. Uh, and we're seeing this not just in kind of U.S., but we're seeing in LATAM, obviously India is being hit. We're seeing in Middle East, North Africa. So Q3 is starting to see a decline in early stage investment, which are typically impacted less by public markets. So now the reality is setting in with the founders that, you know, it is, it is a new reality. So you need to kind of keep that in mind as you're, kind of go, going through the burn or, you know, kind of planning for your next stage of growth. And let's talk about what's happening here in India. And Sanjay, I want to address that issue with you. Uh, you know, the Indian startup ecosystem is not immune. We're seeing uh, uh, pink slips being handed out across uh, Indian startups as well. Uh, but the edtech sector seems to be particularly vulnerable. And I, I want to go back again to the point that Zuckerberg made about overestimating uh, the, uh, the estimates or the assumptions brought on by the pandemic. I mean, if I were to take a look at the largest layoffs that have happened in India, Baiju's 4,000, Unacademy 1,150, Lido Learning 1,200, Vedantu 724, it's the edtech sector uh, that seems to be particularly in pain at this point in time. Where do you see uh, vulnerability specifically from an India standpoint? Sure, Shri. You know, uh, when uh, at the advent of COVID, when it, uh, like Priya said, it's still not, you know, it's still not done that, but when it started, uh, there were some sectors that were lifted, you know, uh, the, the tide lifted some boats far more than the others. And, you know, I'm not an expert, domain expert per se in edtech, but what I will say is that that was one of the sectors which was most positively impacted because suddenly you had, you know, uh, uh, teachers who could, uh, you know, the, the entire industry got democratized. You could see them coming online. You also had students coming online. Uh, the number of, of uh, uh, mobile devices at home that were shared, you know, during the day for uh, kids learning and then entertainment, let's say in the evening was, uh, you know, one lost counterfeit. It also built on the back of Geo's, you know, tremendous game changer. I think one, uh, uh, I guess one trend or the impact that uh, the industry overestimated, including VCs and some founders, is that it would be a zero or one or a you know a black or white in the sense that that the trend would be irreversible and that all uh, you know learning uh, behavior would shift uh, online, which is not necessarily true, right? You have uh, I think what has changed now is the uh, weightage between the online and offline. It's always going to be uh, hybrid. And in one sense, it's always, you know, in boom, boom times, it's always uh, it's always a rush to growth, right? How fast can you grow? How quickly can you grow? Uh, not just in terms of become a unicorn, but in terms of getting market share. And uh, we've seen that also in the past, right? You know, I'll go back, like, you know, Will and Priya, also students of history, venture history. If you go back uh, 20 years, uh, you know, uh, Sequoia had the, you know, debt spiral uh, deck, right, which was really that, come back to fundamentals and conserve cash. You are 
simply going to survive with a simple rule how long your cash can last right versus if your money dries up and that's true i think in consumer and certain sectors so of course those those sides were lifted the strongest again i do believe that the the coming back to fundamentals the strong platforms will survive because there is no doubt shreen that it is a irreversible trend it's just that uh, you know the proportions of online offline are going to change but the fact is i don't think we ever going to go back to you know a uh, uh, purely mm. only offline learning and not online it's just that the impact perhaps was overestimated yes uh, and you know i, I want to pick up on what you said there and, and get will to comment on that uh, will since uh, sanjay said that both uh, priya you and sanjay himself uh, you know are, are, uh, are have a little bit of perspective on venture history so i want to understand from you will how do you see this uh, being different uh, from what we saw in the early 2000s what we saw in 2008 or is is it really pretty much the same you know there are a lot of uh, now sort of analogies being drawn about what happened then what should we do now what the playbook should look like uh, you know what's your view from here on because the world is dramatically different as well yeah i'm sure you're asking an important question and this is actually my fourth slowdown i started i was an e-commerce pioneer in the early 90s I went through 2000 as an investor. I went through 2008, and um, and and here's one thing that's fundamentally different: is that many of the companies here, while they may have made some mistakes in their execution and growth, and and obviously the India is seeing a number of those right now in terms of growth at any cost, they now have to pull back, and that's painful. The fundamental companies can still be good though, and so if the entrepreneurs get with the program. um adjust their spend rate they can come back to something that's actually got decent unit economics is is real business that was not the case in 2000 there were a whole lot of businesses that were simply built on vapor and they're selling vapor to one another and those businesses all died and they deserve to die quite frankly on the other hand there's some good businesses that came out of it because they were strong had some fundamentals they continued so it, it, the the corrections are a great culling and and it culls the bad but it leaves room for the good and uh, i think 2008 actually it probably impacted even the good and the bad at the same time so here in this case i i feel again good about the correction i think there's going to be more capital flowing into the market into the good companies um i i agree with uh, everybody who said that you know it's going to be some tough times but entrepreneurs who frankly have the shit together with numbers are going to do okay and uh, and those are the ones that are, the venture capitals are going to put their money into and in the ed tech sector alone we have three ed tech deals that have been funded since the slowdown all right just in the past 6 months not one of our portfolio companies has laid off even one person due to the slowdown so it is entirely possible for good companies to be growing in this market yes uh, you're right uh, that uh, if you do have your business fundamentals and your spend rates in check uh you will be able to ride out the downturn and that is something that we have seen with many companies of course some companies at this point in time are correcting but as will was pointing out the kind of euphoria that we saw the frothy valuations perhaps a correction uh, does put a lot of that uh, sometimes excessive behavior uh, to uh, correct as well but priya you know i, I want to address uh, another issue which is capturing headlines uh, with you two actually one of course the collapse that we're seeing in the cryptocurrency the market what's happened as far as ftx is concerned the binance deal not going through a complete route uh, in terms of prices uh, you know forget what it's doing as far as uh, the crypto market per se is concerned what does this mean you know to your larger point about the innovation economy does it set that back yeah you know i think uh, it's a uh... when when high is high everything is hot right like every, everybody wants has that fomo of like wanting to be a part of that deal right now i think it all ties back to all the things that we were saying earlier now it's like kind of like let's focus on what matters let's focus on not the vanity metrics but the metrics that matter metrics that really going to help the fundamentals i think that's a push across all of it and i think the investors gi- giving uh, the founders uh, the right approach to kind of think through what matters and i think that's where you're seeing the shift you know something that was extremely hot like maybe the year ago is not necessarily the case today so i think uh, to sanjay's point some of the fun, some of the great companies that is going to come out of using crypto or blockchain uh, is going to survive and thrive through this ecosystem because i think the way how, how we're doing things have changed because of some of the structural benefits that uh, these these you know innovation is bringing in so i think uh, that's what's happening i do want to highlight one thing that was very interesting your you know your question about 
you know, how the this cycle is different from the early 2000s? Because we get asked this question because we've been around for 40 plus years. Maybe I can uh, address like one point on that one as well. Uh, you know, one thing we have to remember is the innovation ecosystem economy is to like 3x larger in 2020 compared to 2000. Uh, the business models are much better. Uh, the markets are kind of, that the companies are going after the TAM is much, much larger. Uh, and the companies have a lot more liquidity. So uh, something to keep in mind, despite the pullback that we're seeing uh, from VC, the companies are still being funded as Will said earlier. Um, so there's a massive amount of dry powder as well. So that's a huge difference between the cycle that we had in early 2000 to what we have today. And you know you had a second question uh, outside Not of the crypto. The size of the, yeah, I, I did have a second question uh, on Twitter, but I would imagine that that will require a whole show of its own. But I want to understand from you what you make of what's going on in Twitter, Priya. You know, I think uh, we're all waiting and watching. We're all waiting and watching what the next week is going to be. But, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, just going back to fundamentals, I think all you're going to see, unfortunately or fortunately, there's going to be a lot of these news uh, of the layoffs and, you know, the cost cuts is going to happen because end of the day, the founders and investors are focusing kind of the fundamentals of the business model and profitability and what that means to company fundamentals. And if that means making some tough decisions uh, related to cutting costs, it's going to happen. Um, but uh, hopefully everybody does the right way of doing so. So I think that's what it comes down to. Uh, yes, uh, you know, companies will be forced to lay off, as is very evident, uh, but to do it transparently, to do it with empathy, to do it with, uh, uh, you know, dignity, I think that is also crucial and one of the key asks at this point in time. But Will, uh, you know, what do you want to take a stab at first, Twitter or the crypto chaos? Well, I, I've been posting to Facebook about Twitter for a while now, and, and I, I call it a, it's hard not to watch a train wreck in slow motion. Um, and um, at some level, again, you, you, when we talk about all these layoffs from, from Twitter, Facebook, um, the expected from Microsoft and others, um, but you also have to look at how much they grew in the past year and two years, which was a, huge numbers, right? Double digit percentage employee growth. So at some level, again, they, they just, they accelerated into the pandemic boom too much. And now they're having to correct. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with that in the grand scheme of things. If, as you said a moment ago, it's done with some level of, uh, of humanness and, and, and reasonable uh, process. And, and I think most CEOs are gonna try to do that. Not, not all of them apparently, but most. Um, so I, I think uh, Twitter's in for a lot of pain. And uh, at some level, the advertisers are the people I look at uh, because they're, they're the customers and, and ultimately the customer is always right. And if you got advertisers pulling back because you're making the wrong cuts, um, that should tell you something. I, I hope that Elon is listening to them. Uh, he certainly would not always appear to be so if you read his Twitter feed. I want to end by talking to you about China and what's going on there and the impact and implications that it's going to have for global liquidity uh, and for India's startup ecosystem as well. Shreen, I'm glad you asked that because, and Sanjay, I appreciate the label. And my dad, who actually is a professor, might quibble about whether I am or not. But um, Shireen, uh, I, I think there's, there's billions of dollars that were targeted to China that, um, and at least fives of billions, if not, if not tens of billions, that are going to end up going somewhere else. And the question is, what share of that does India get? Um, and this is global LP investors who were looking at China as, as still a growth story, despite some of the challenges. And now they might be saying, you know what, China's becoming an isolationist story, and I'm not going to put my money in there. I don't want to invest into a Roach Motel where the money goes in and never comes out. So I do think that India has a good opportunity to grab a lot of that money, uh, both from the individual founders that are raising money, as well as from the venture capitalists here that we're all looking to raise money and bring it into this country and put it to work. So the, the, the demographic dividend is here to be uh, realized. There's a, millions of people looking for jobs, looking for buying pro products out in India 2 and India 3. The economy is actually still moving forward, unlike the, the, the uh, economies in the U.S. and Europe. And so I think it's a growth story here, despite the, the short-term pain that we're all going to feel. So I remain optimistic. I think that China is a loser in this game. I think India is a winner. I think Southeast Asia is a high, big competitor. India is going to have to stand up next to the alternative places for money to go there. And, uh, and I, I, again, I think it's going to be a great time in the next couple of years to be an investor and to be a smart entrepreneur who, as Sanjay says, you know, understands unit economics, understands fundamentals, and, and builds a solid business. Will Poole, uh, 
Sanjay Nath and Priya Rajan, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us on this special edition of Young Turks Voices from the Valley uh, to decode what we make of the current uh, tech uh, austerity, tech collapse, tech crunch, call it what you like, uh, the impact and the implications for the Indian startup ecosystem as well. Always a pleasure, appreciate your time. We'll take a break. There's a lot more coming up. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a minute with more.